DLD stage. Yes, I'm very honored that you're here. Thank you. The honor is mine. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a long time. Um, I usually live in Hong Kong, but today I'm going to talk about Web3 digital property rights and touch a little bit on gaming. Um, you know, my name is Yat. I'm the chairman and co-founder of a company called Animoca Brands. Uh, we're probably most known for our activity in basically helping build the Web3 ecosystem. We seeded companies like OpenSea, Dapper Labs, Wax, Decentraland. Uh, we basically incubated and uh, grew a business called The Sandbox, which is probably best known for, you know, metaverse land and over 380 other portfolio companies. But today, I'm not going to talk about the business. I'm going to talk about our conviction on Web3 and digital property rights and why we think that's so important. But I thought I'll start a little bit about my own background. I'll go really fast. I was born in Vienna in the 70s, so I am dating myself. And I um, uh, studied music. And one first impact in my life, which sort of gave, gave us our perspective on Web3, was my mom used to work at the Komische Oper at the east side of Berlin, which had an impact on me as I would visit her, for all of those of you who would remember. But the way that I entered the digital space was, and only German people will appreciate the David Hasselhoff figure there, um, is, uh, is that if you grew up in the 80s in the German-speaking region, that was your impression of America. He was American culture. But anyway, and when I actually went to America, I had culture shock uh, because it wasn't anything like it. But the thing is, I entered basically the digital space through an acoustic coupler, a modem, with CompuServe, a pre-internet type servers, when there were really only maybe 100,000 people online, and Germany had its own version with Fidonet, um, and I basically went on then with, a, with an Atari computer, and I continued in that space. But today we are at a place where, whether you call it the internet, the metaverse, whatever, we're basically spending all of our time online. The majority of our waking hours is spent digitally, it's between 10 to 8 hours on average in the top, top countries. And what's really happening, and this is sort of our, the important mission about Web3, is that it's all about the world's most valuable resource, which is basically farming our time and attention for data, which we think is more valuable than any resource in the world, because it's the way in which the digital world and our attention becomes most valuable. What we're seeing right now is not that data itself is what's valuable, it's what the data can create. You wouldn't have self-driving cars if we weren't driving the cars to create that information. Facebook would not be as valuable as it is today if we weren't actually spending time on it and actually giving it that data. So effectively, we've become digitally colonized. We are giving our data. We think it's free. In reality, we're being refined through this network effect, and that network effect does not belong to us. And the net effect, of course, is that we live in a world that is futile. Right? And I think some of you already know this. And so what is the solution around how we can basically take back our digital data, our digital property rights? How can we actually get out of a space where we are dependent? App developers need to depend on Apple to allow them on the platform. Right? That handle on Instagram, that's not your handle. Right? Everything we're doing is building the, the network up that isn't ours. This is why we are so big believers in Web3, in particular non-fungible tokens as true digital property rights. Because data is no longer a private good owned by an institution that controls it, which also means controlling our identity and all the value that comes from it. Rather, it sits on a public chain in which people can openly and freely compose on which means that we can now actually have the effect of owning digital property for real because it's away from centralized platforms. Let me illustrate this. You know, we're in Germany, so it's, I guess, the, uh, the center of, I guess, cars, you could say. The fact that we have millions of ownership of cars around the world is the platform of growth, not the fact that you actually are dependent on a single company, but rather the decentralized ownership of cars has allowed for things like Uber or Lyft you know, tire companies, electronics companies, car park companies, music companies, all of that industry around the ownership of cars is far, far greater than the sale of the car itself. This is true for everything. The fact that you can own a house is the reason the bank can give you a mortgage. The fact that you own an iPhone is the reason why a case company or a headphone company or any of those companies can give you a value-added service free from having the dependency. You don't have to go and talk to BMW to basically buy a baby seat nor do you have to go to Tesla to hire a driver. But that's the digital world right now, which means we don't have the ability to create these platforms of growth because we don't have digital ownership. And so what happens with Web3 and non-fungible tokens, which is the beginning stages of this and why we initially focused with gaming as well, is that when you own a digital item, whether this is a board ape or land and sandbox or even a gaming item, you actually have the freedom to take it wherever you want, 
one mental model to think about is, for those of you who know a game called Fortnite, one of the biggest games in the world, imagine that all the assets, all the skins, which are like digital fashion, were actually on chain. It allows any other company in the world to maybe open up something like a Fashionite for, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of Fortnite Fashion Week. And they can create a service without having to talk to Epic. They just have to talk to the users who own these assets. That is basically what distributed and de decentralized ownership means. And they create basically more network effects on top of it. Now, owning stuff is also identity. So when a lot of people are, have difficulties with you know, Web3 and digital ownership, they say, well, what's the value of an ape, right? And it used to be that the ape was very similarly valid to a broken bag. But the point I'm trying to illustrate is that the reason you buy any fashion item or any asset or even a house has very little to do with its pure utility. People don't buy this bag because they can put stuff in it. 99% of its value is virtual. It's a network effect. It's a story. It's what touches us as humans. And the same is true for virtual avatars or digital fashion. That's basically what it means for these, uh, these sort of value of these items as well. And they become part of our network effect. But it is a hidden network effect. Everything that we buy, our shoes, we don't buy them because they make us faster. They're, we have a prefer preference to a Nike or an Adidas or a Puma shoe, for instance. And so this has gone to this effect where people have been buying virtual land. Just to give you some sort of uh, and digital assets and NFTs, even in the so-called bear market in crypto, non-fungible tokens, which are basically represented for these digital property um, in these assets, has seen close to $20 billion of trades last year uh, from an industry that is still very nascent. Now, why are we focusing on gaming? We think gaming is the first entry point to digital ownership because actually gaming is a $200 billion industry today, larger than, um, larger than movies and music combined, and people are already buying virtual items of lots of value. And in fact, a small percentage are the ones who are spending this money, but it drives a $100 billion virtual asset business, which is all rental. You buy the skin on Fortnite, it's not yours. But the, you ask a player, you ask your children if they buy something on Roblox or they own something in Minecraft, they will tell you, actually, I should own that. That is mine. That's what they believe, even though it's not. But it also means that you can construct these network effects because you always need to be permissioned. It's like owning a house that's not really yours or having a car that you could never actually do stuff with except always seek permission with. What does a physical world look like if the, it mimics a digital world? It's restricted. It has less freedom. So the thing that we believe in is that the digital world has low to no property rights because everything is permissioned. It's very similar to living maybe in North Korea. It might be fun, but in reality, actually, well, maybe not that fun, but in reality, there's no network effects to be constructed from it. But we can see in the physical world, every country that has strong property rights, say like Germany, has more GDP because you can construct these network effects on top of it, these benefits of capital formation. And, you know, in, whoops, whoa, all right. And one of the challenges we have today as well is, and we think Web3 can help solve this, is that there is a broad issue, particularly in the West, around an anti-capitalist view, because it hasn't worked for them. Young people are basically despondent around the situation. And unfortunately, this effect of, this chilling effect of people's negative perception of capitalism, therefore what sort of property might mean, is also destabilizing global democracies, which we can see today. And we actually think Web3 can help solve for that in a few interesting ways, uh, which we can't go into full details. But first, when you think of the metaverse, when you think of public blockchains, when you think of basically digital property rights, really we need to think of them in terms of new national economies. Every game is a society of some sort anyway. People have real feelings, they're actual economies. But in this case, they have real meaning because they're on chain. And I'm not talking about just the currencies, I'm talking about the assets and the values that might come from it. So they're the construction of these new economies that actually simulate real life. And instead of having to go to, you know, in the, in the old days, people might discover new countries. Some of us are talking about going to space, for instance, to discover maybe new opportunities. But here, where our virtual time is, attention, that's the real opportunity, we think. Because actually, most of the world is already online right now, except we don't own any of that. And we can build virtual countries, virtual constructions, virtual societies, virtual economies, entirely basically through what some people describe as a metaverse, but really starting with the foundation of digital property rights. And the big change is that when you have digital property rights, as you have, particularly in the West, I think people take it for granted, 
because that's what you've been experiencing all this time. But in reality, if you don't have digital property rights, you can't have many of these economic freedoms. You don't have the freedom to transact if you can't own it, for instance. These are things that become possible. It also means that companies will change basically from company-owned platforms to community-owned platforms. If you take a look at, for instance, blockchains like Ethereum, they're not owned by one entity, they're owned by the community. And what happens is that with Web3, we get into a stage where we can build a more open, fair, and more democratic internet. And more importantly, when people talk about tokenization, often people just think about crypto and they think about Bitcoin, but really what it represents is ownership. And it takes this thing for the classic form of capitalism that we describe as shareholder capitalism into stakeholder capitalism, because everyone is now an owner. Meaning that if you own land in something like Sandbox, or if you own an NFT, you're actually an owner in the assets. You're not actually a consumer. But everything else in the classic form of capitalism is as a consumer. You're there to spend, you're there to be extracted from. But in this context, because we're the providers of the data, we create network effects when we're inside these games, when we're inside Facebook, when we're inside these digital worlds, we're actually providing basically value. Why should we not actually be paid for that? If all of us stopped using Facebook, for instance, then what's the value of Facebook? Nothing. So why are we spending time on it freely? And that is what Web3 in part can help solve. So I'll close with this quote because I'm just about out of time. You know, George Washington has said it best. He said, freedom and property rights are inseparable. You can't have one without the other. And we believe the same is true for digital freedom. You can't have digital freedom without digital property rights. Thank you.